Um, hello and welcome to Ecology and Conservation of Sierra Nevada Bumblebees, which is going to be presented by Helen Laughlin. My name is Meredith w Walker and we're so glad that you could join us. I'm the communication specialist for the Institute for Bird Populations and I'll be serving as the host for this Zoom webinar. So um, before I introduce Helen, I would like to introduce our organization to any of those, any of you who might not be familiar with it. Um, the Institute for Bird Populations is a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1989 to study the causes of bird population declines. The Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship, or MAPS, program was our first major initiative and our best known program. Um, MAPS gathers critical information about the health of bird populations on their breeding grounds using data collected at bird banding stations. We run a sister Ah, excuse me, a sister program monitoring bird populations on their wintering grounds in Latin America and the Caribbean called El Monitoreo de Sobrevivencia Invernal, or MOSI. We also offer training in bird banding and conduct studies on molten plumage. IBP collaborates locally, nationally, and internationally with government agencies, universities, and NGOs to assess the effects of climate change, land management actions, and other ecological stressors on populations of birds and more recently pollinators, and to prescribe practical solutions to conservation challenges. So apparently today is Giving Tuesday, and if you're inspired by our webinar today and would like to support our work, um, please consider making a tax deductible donation, and I will put a link to our donations page in the chat panel. Um, and now to introduce our speaker, biologist Helen Laughlin. Helen is IBP's meadow specialist, but I often refer to her by her unofficial title, Sierra Meadow Queen Bee. <laughs> Helen has spent the last 20 years studying willow flycatchers and other meadow birds, carnivores, insects, plants, and fish, primarily in the Sierra Nevada. She is particularly interested in the complex disturbance regime, sorry, in the complex disturbance regimes and associated ecological relationships in Sierra Meadows and for the last five years has worked on multi-species bird monitoring protocols for meadow restoration. She is now expanding her research into pollinator use of ephemeral riparian and upland habitats in post-fire landscapes. Today, Helen will be introducing us to the ecology of bumblebees and some of the research IBP is doing to help to conserve them in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so I promise to stop talking in just a minute, but I need to mention a few procedural items. First, um, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website, birdpop.org, in the next couple of days. So if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch this. Um, two, um, when you joined us on Zoom, your microphone should have been automatically muted. Please keep it that way unless I tell you otherwise. There are almost 60 people on this session and it will get confusing if we're all making noise and there's background noise. Um, third, Helen will be answering questions after the presentation, so please ask any of your questions in the chat window. I will keep track of them and consolidate them so that I can pose them to Helen at the end, and if we have extra time, we can just ask more questions after we get through those. Um, and lastly, if you are hard of hearing or having trouble with the audio, there's a live transcript available. Um, so to enable that, look for a button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and it may be under the three dots that are labeled more, um, but it's a live transcript being provided by a computer, and so expect there to be a lot of errors. Um, and so now I would like to turn this over to Helen. All right. Thank you, Meredith. I am going to share my screen. And if everything goes as planned, you will shortly be seeing my presentation. Um, let's see. I need to use it on slideshow. So Meredith, can you can you see that since I can hear you? I can. OK, that's good. All right. Um, so as Meredith said, I'm going to talk today about bumblebee ecology and conservation in the Sierra. Um, I want to, although I'm giving the presentation, <laughs> I want to acknowledge that as on the slide, there's a lot of people both uh, at IBP and elsewhere that have uh, worked a lot on all of the projects that I'm going to talk about today. So um, I just want to remember that they are also part of these projects. Um, and also, I want to, I like to always say up front, 
Um, although I have learned a lot about uh, bumblebees over the last six or so years, I am not an expert, so there could be some questions that um, I can't answer, but I will gladly uh, help find answers to some of those if um, I can. Okay, let me, I wanna make sure I'm using this thing right. Okay, so what I wanna talk about today, there's a couple things. One is how we got to a place where IBP is doing bumblebee um, research, kind of an overview of our uh, bumblebee and pollinator program, some basics on bumblebees, because I don't know with, you know, with this webinar, we, we could have a real range of um, knowledge levels, uh, some about our, the survey methods that we've developed, and then jump into some of the results from our El Dorado National Forest fire area, our Pumas National Forest uh, project, some of the ongoing meadow restoration projects, and then a, a larger um, sort of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service led regional western bumblebee um, modeling project, and then kind of where where we hope to go. Uh, let's see. Okay, so to start with, it's that that question of how did a group called the Institute for Bird Populations end up working with bumblebees because bumblebees um, are clearly not birds. But what what was happening is that um, that IBP, that's Institute for Population, we call ourselves IBP. Um, we were working with the Forest Service um, monitoring birds in a number of um, areas throughout the Sierra Nevada at the same time that. Uh, the western bumblebee was added to the Forest Service uh, sensitive species list, those species that they need to manage for and, and understand habitat needs for. And at that same time, uh, the Forest Service received some large chunks of mitigation funds from uh, various places in response to uh, some wildfires that had happened. And so they had this, this wildfire mitigation money that oh, needed to be spent uh, within project areas um, that were burned and they needed to know whether Western bumblebees were in that in those places. And so they asked us, hey, you're working on birds in these fire areas. What do you think about working with bumblebees? Um, I, of course, as I always do, jumped at the <laughs> at, at new projects. I, I was very excited, but not just because it was a new project, but I've um, always wanted to work more with um, invertebrates and insects within especially meadow areas. Uh, it was something that I originally wanted to do as a graduate student uh, project and it sort of didn't work out. So this was a great opportunity. And then also we um, were hap just at the time happened to be working with a bumblebee expert out of San Francisco State University, Gretchen LeBun. And we were working with her on bird work. Um, but she uh, really is known for her bumblebee work. So we went to her and asked for um, some help and she found us a wonderful graduate student, Erin Elsie, who's worked with us on every project since then. So that's kind of how that started. Yes, okay. And I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. I'm not no. sure, somebody must not be muted, which is fine, but I, if I'm distracted, uh, that's yeah. what it is. Um, okay, so let me move on. So our um, Institute for Bird Populations Pollinator Program, we kind of use some of the same objectives in all of the different projects I'm gonna to talk to you about today. One of those is to record abundance and diversity of bumblebees on the landscape. Um, and that, uh, you know, with a special emphasis on finding Western bumblebee because of its uh, declines, it's, but also all bumblebee species. Um, we want to look at bumblebee um, and plant species associations because those floral resources are so important to uh, the bumblebees that we're studying. Uh, and also look at basic habitat uh, use patterns so that we can better understand land management um, and how it can affect different aspects of bumblebee life cycles. And then kind of bringing it full circle is really one of our, our big objectives is providing guidance for land managers so that um, we can better manage landscapes with bumblebees in mind, especially Western bumblebees, they are declining. And then I always, this is a, a shout out to one of my co-authors and, and partners in crime on this, Erin Elsie from Stillwater Sciences. She, She's trained a lot of our field crews and she always talks about bumblebees as the gateway bug because they're just such cute little fuzzy teddy bears and that they often are an insect that people are willing to really, even if they're not comfortable with insects, to touch and look at and they often draw people into being more interested in these sort of birds in general. So that's my photo of a, a, a Bombus griseocola and it's one of my faves. Okay, so just a little bit of bumblebee life cycle information. 
um, a lot of people are familiar with social insects and think of uh, European honeybees. That's something that we all are pretty familiar with from, you know, the, that we get honey from them and that they're used for pollination services in the US, even though they're not native here. Um, but bumblebees, while similar because they're a social insect, are, are different in, in a couple of really important ways. Uh, honeybees have these colonies, these hives that can grow bigger and bigger and survive year after year, overwintering, surviving on the honey. Bumblebees have in, in, are different in that they just have an annual life cycle. They don't continue a nest or reproductive unit does not continue to grow year after year. Only queens, um, single queens will survive one year and the colony is just a one year cycle. So I'm just gonna go over that. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but at the top of this image, it shows this hibernating queen underground, usually in something like a rodent hole or in a, in a dead tree over winter. She emerges in early spring and will build little wax cups and start storing uh, pollen and nectar in that for when she's rearing her young. She then start laying eggs um, on and around and in those wax cups as well, but she's still going out and foraging, collecting pollen and nectar and bringing it back and keeping herself going um, while she's basically sitting on those eggs and keeping them warm until they, they um, develop and hatch. And so once her first brood of workers, which are also female, um, are mature and able to start foraging for pollen and nectar, then she stays in the nest after that and continues to brood the new nests, um, the new nest, new eggs that she continues to lay over the course of that, that summer season. While the, um, the different groups or cohorts of, of worker bees go out and start doing all the foraging, bringing back food for her and for the developing um, larva. And at the end of that summer, the queen switches from laying eggs that develop into workers and starts laying eggs that develop into queens for next year and the males. And so at that end of summer period, um, when the, queen, the new queens and the males emerge, they'll mate um, and and the new queen will go and find an underground or some place to hibernate over winter. But all the all of the workers, all of the males, and the last year's queens are all going to die at the end of that season. So it's only that new queen that moves on into the next year. So that's just kind of an important thing to understand, um, you know, relative to how we think of other bee, uh, honeybees, which is just what most people are familiar with. So we don't have a population that can keep getting bigger and bigger. We really have a uh, a single year cycle. Um, okay. And so coming back to IBP's pollinator program, um, we've been working in a number of different areas. The first couple on this list are projects that I mentioned that we where we got started working in fire areas and looking at both upland and riparian habitats and, and um, forest management. We've worked on the gooseness adaptive management area on the Klamath National Forest, which is in, in Northeastern California. Um, looking at different timber management, uh, long-term uh, methods and how that might affect uh, bumblebee populations. And then we have a, a whole list of meadows that we're working at. And I noticed that because I'm so um, biased towards the meadows, I listed all the meadow names out here, but for all the other projects, I just lumped them together. But anyhow, there, there's, there's a lot that we've got going on. Um, and so, uh, Again, this is that same information. It just shows you kind of within the state where things are. Um, these uh, in blue are these California Department of Fish and Wildlife meadows that we were um, collaborated with the department on setting up some um, sites at, at meadows that were in pretty good shape and that we wanted to kind of collect some uh, initial monitoring data there. The red dots are the fire and riparian areas. Uh, yellowed up, up dot up in the uh, at the top of the screen, which hopefully you can see, actually it's hidden behind my um, Zoom bar, but um, that's where we're looking at forest management. And then the green dots are the meadow restoration projects that we're monitoring. And just to get a sense of what we're talking about here, the, I've, I've listed these two project types, the number of captures of bumblebees that we have for those projects um, so far. Um, and these all started, you know, around the, some of these started in 2015, some of them more recently, uh, but mostly right now it's the meadow restoration projects that are ones that are still ongoing. Okay. And so one of the things when we started work, working with bumblebees is we, um, in talking with Gretchen Levon and Aaron Elsie, our partners, we wanted to think about uh, potentially using some 
something some non-lethal field methods so that um, fewer bumblebees were being collected. Typically with um, projects that collect insects, usually we collect and then pin and store those insects in museums or in other collections um, for use with DNA projects or just as a reference collection. And so although we do collect some um, bumblebees for a small reference collection, we decided to use a method that relied more on in-hand identification and photo identification um, and not so much on um, lethal collection methods. Just although, you know, mostly we would be collecting workers which aren't re necessarily a reproductive unit per se, we just want to limit our impact on some of these species that are not doing well. Um, so basically then the, what we have is a, and I'll show you some slides that can make, make this a little more sense, but we'll, we use these standard 20 meter circular plots that we visit repeatedly over the season and, and then year after year and multi-year projects where we do the exact same uh, 16 minute active search of that um, circular plot, collecting with the net all the bumblebees that we find in the, in the plot. We put them into little plastic vials and into an ice chest where we cool them down so that they slow down enough that we can um, look at them and identify them after the fact. Um, we record, so after, after they've cooled and we've finished our 16 minute uh, search of the plot, we will take them back out of the ice chest and photograph them. And we keep uh, records so that each photograph is linked to um, a, an individual capture with the date and the location and time information. Um, and so we store, we store those photographs sort of essentially as um, a reference collection as well that can be taken back to any specific bee we can look up. Um, and then once they warm back up again, those bumblebees fly off and continue to do their foraging and taking um, pollen and nectar back to the nest. We uh, always record the plant species that bumblebees are captured on so that we can understand what plants are, are being used by bumblebees in our project areas. And then we also record um, what plants are blooming within the plot so that we can look at both what they're selecting to, to forage on within a plot, but also what their choices were essentially um, within that plot. And that gives us more information on, on some of that uh, what the plants they're preferring to use at any given part uh, day or any, any time. And we also collecting basic data about the, what that plot's like, how much tree cover does it have, is there a creek running through it, things like that. Um, and then that identification that we do is based largely um, on, on just uh, characteristics that you can see in hand. That's a really great thing about bumblebees versus some of the other bees or other insects that you might capture. Uh, you can get to the species level really without needing a microscope or to take it back to the lab. And so that's the, 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 it's a taxa that uh, lends itself to doing these types of surveys. Um, and this is just an example. Um, one of the species we, we capture pretty regularly is this Bombus mixtus. And we have um, ID guides that show us color patterns for the different um, casts that we might find and, and, and what color patterns are available to our Sierra Nevada project area. This is just another example, similar thing where we have these guides that show us how we, when we have species that are very similar in appearance, the sort of um, smaller details that you might look at to um, tell them apart. And this is kind of a fun one. One of the things beyond just those color patterns are things like the cheek the size of the, the cheek, sort of the area between the eye and the mouth. There's some short, short cheek species like the one on the left, this Bombus griseocolis, which has sort of got this little smashed in, um, kind of like a pug dog face. And on the right is Bombus appositus, which is a long cheek species. And it has kind of that long snout, like a, like a, a, a wiener dog face, <laughs> I think about them. But so those are some of the ways that we, we identify species in hand. Uh, so back to this slide, I just want to now move into some of our specific projects. You see I put a little purple circle down there around the Power Fire and Fred's Fire. Um, red dots, those are actually the ones I'm going to talk about, not so much the restoration, of meadow restoration at this point, um, that we, we've collected data down there. So this is an example showing what that Power Fire um, looked like. The red, big red polygon is sort of the perimeter of that fire that, that burned many years ago now. 
and and the, the small dots that you're seeing on the screen are showing where our survey plots are, those 20 meter circular plots. And for this project, we had them in um, clusters of five. Sometimes they're uh, in, in long transects running up and down a, a stream system. But this is just kind of giving an example of what that looks like for a study design. And there we go. Um, and so on to some of the results. So this project actually is one that we had the most years of data collecting uh, within that within the project area. And so one of the first things that really jumped out at us is when we just looked at the abundance of bumblebees, where and it's been corrected for capture rate, so that it's the amount of effort spent surveying um, is standardized between all of these. And you can see that in 2016 we had just massively more bumblebees captured. Um, across the board than we did in, in other years. And so that's one of the things that jumps out right away is that there's a lot of oral variation from year to year in, in the numbers of bumblebees that you're gonna see on the landscape. One of the next things that, that kind of jumps out is this is just taking each year ind individually and showing you what species were present and what proportion of the, of the overall um, community they made up. Um, and with many of our projects, so like the, the main part of this, this each of these pie charts is the brown area, which is um, Bombus vosnesinskii, which is one of our most common species. And um, and you know you can really see that that is definitely the case here. Although it's interesting how we saw over 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 the years that those proportions of some of the other species really changed quite a bit. And so we're we're interested in, hope, in, in hoping to find out over time more about what's you know, allowing some species to increase and some are decreasing and what conditions uh, different bumblebee species uh, need to thrive. Just some nice, some more bumblebee photos of some of our most common species in this project area. And then the results of, of looking at some of those uh, habitat condition uh, variables that we collected, all of those survey plots, we looked at these for each species to see if there was something that really stood out. And so looking at elevation for six of these species, the dark lines are the ones that had a significant relationship. So for six of the species, they were significantly more likely to occupy an area the higher in elevation you went. Um, four species or five species were more likely to occupy a location if it was a riparian or streamside zone versus an upland area. And then for one species, that Vosnesinskii, uh, the presence of bear clover, um, uh, the, the more bear clover present, the more likely you were to um, detect Bombus vosnesinskii on that plot. Same kind of thing looking at shrub cover, overstory cover, and herbaceous cover. For some species, for, for three of our like main species actually, overstory cover, um, like conifer cover was something that um, decre decreased the likelihood of detection, um, whereas Pretty much all species were more likely to, to occupy a plot, the more herbaceous cover. And so by herbace herbaceous cover, yes, it's grasses and sedges, but really what you should be thinking about is wildflowers, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing that as those are increasing, you're seeing, you're more likely to check bumblebees. So from there, we went and looked more at the actual what plants are they using, not just are they, we found that they're in areas that are, you know, that have more blooming plants, but what plants are they selecting relative to how available those plants are in the landscape. Um, the dots above the dotted line are ones that were being selected um, more than you would expect just based on how available that plant was. And dots below the line are ones that were selected less than you would expect based on how prevalent that plant was. So like at the bottom of this chart, you see white thorn, which is this shrub that covers these post-fire landscapes and they're covered in white blooms. It's very available, very abundant, yet the bumblebees were not selecting that um, very often. So even though it was abundant, they didn't, they, they were so not selecting it versus something like at the top of the slide where you have this group of Phacelia species or bear clover, which was being selected even more than you would expect just based on how available that plant was. And so it gets starts to get to understanding what plants are really being preferred um, and used uh, preferentially by bumblebees. Taking some of that same data, these plants that, that we know that they like and are using and looking at how that timing is. And so we can see how many captures, bumblebee captures were on different plants over time. 
And this really the, the point is showing the slide is that these bumblebees are needing a lot of different plant species to fill that, that whole window of the spring, summer, and fall with resources. You know, one plant, if you had an area that was covered by just a single plant species, the bloom window is not likely to provide foraging resources the whole summer. And just a nice slide with some of those preferred plant species from the El Dorado area, because um, it's nice to look at wildfires. Okay, so now I'm gonna move um, same kind of information, same data to collection techniques, but I'm gonna move up to the moonlight fire, which was um, up in, in the Plumas National Forest further north at the same time period. The map on the left is showing you how we had uh, the green dots are all the bumblebee plot locations that were in transects along these streamside zones. We actually, for this project, uh, had a number of places where we co-located um, bird survey plots so that we could collect both bird and bumblebee data in the same exact location. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then just to get a sense of what these riparian zone lo looked like, the, the kind of picture in the upper right shows this regenerating uh, willow and aspen area after fire went through. But some of the some of the stream sites in this area had very low intensity fire and would would have, you know, still have a lot of common agricultural range. And then just the gratuitous photo of a lovely uh, Nevada bumblebee on um, Meadow Pinston, which is one of my favorite flowers, one of their favorite flowers. And so when we looked at the bird and the bumblebee data together that were co-located, um, one of the things, the first things that kind of jumped out at us is the, as if you're looking at something to the left of this vertical line, it's telling you that, that more of that um, habitat characteristic, as, as overstory cover gets higher, um, the, in this case, the birds, significantly use the word significantly less likely to, to occupy those areas. And so that where the stars are kind of showing this, the really significant responses so that the birds were less likely to be found in the areas with a lot of conifer overstory, but more likely to be found in areas with willow cover within the uh, riparian zone. Well, bumblebees really had different um, habitat characteristics that were being selected. Um, Bumblebees did, you know, were less likely to be found in areas with really dense shrub cover, but areas with lots of floral diversity, lots of um, flower richness, and at higher elevation, that's where we would expect to find bees. And so, kind of what we took away from this is that when we're we're looking at at fire restoration or riparian restoration, is that you know riparian birds and bumblebees aren't going to need exactly the same things, and we already know that about um, so many, you know, different of it, it's hard, you can't manage any one acre for every species of wildlife or for every land management use that, you know, that, that it's just not really a, a workable situation. And so that really what this tells us is that when we're looking at managing, you know, streamside zones up and down an area, we need to make sure that there's a lot of heterogeneity, that there's open areas and floral richness for bees, but also willow and other uh, riparian shrub cover for birds. Um, and two, the other thing that I take away from this is that, that these riparian birds and the bumblebees are uh, liking characteristics that are associated with disturbance, whether that's you know, natural wildfire moving through or flooding in riparian zones or avalanche shoots, those things that regenerate and, and regenerate willow and regenerate uh, floral diversity are things that um, benefit a lot of these species. Okay, so this is a really fun slide. It's got a lot going on. But I think it, it comes back to showing you some of that information on how different bumblebees are selecting different plants and that over time, we need a lot of different plants to be blooming to support the bumblebee community. And so at the bottom of this slide, we have um, for the, the main part of it is this day of the year. So we're looking at June, July, and August. And at the top um, with the bumblebee, there's a list of the bumblebees. And actually this, if you're looking, reading this list, this bee bifarious actually has a, a name change, which uh, we haven't updated these slides. It's now um, uh, Bombus vancouverensis. But so forgive me if I'm uh, using the wrong name for that one. But what we're looking at on the slide is how different bumblebee species, the, the line gets thicker as that bumblebee population increases over the course of the year. So we have some late, later season bumblebees that you see the first four lines up here, but we also have an early season bumblebee that emerges early and then goes back into hibernation earlier in the summer. 
Um, same with these plant species. We have this whole list of plants that um, bumblebees selected um, more often than you would expect just based on how available the plants were and when they're blooming. So the, the darkest blue is the peak bloom period for that plant. And you can see, you know, you have some species that are up here in the left corner are the early season um, bloomers and down at the bottom are the late season bloomers. And that all of those are going to be necessary to kind of have a, a, a diversity of plants blooming across the whole season. The, the dots over here are also showing you how certain species, in this case, this uh, Bombus melanopigus, um, really is selecting, they have a, a very high selection index for this penstemon ridbergii, this meadow penstemon. This is a plant that they really select for, um, also selecting for trifolium and mertensia, but just to a lesser degree. But so you can kind of look at this and see that this early season bumblebee, we know this is a species that peaks early, you know, is really selecting these early season uh, plants as well. And so it's just a kind of a way of, of starting to understand how different species are using different plants and how to potentially identify important plants for multiple species, like example down lower here, this Augustace urticafolia, which is horse mint, is highly selected by a number of species. Okay. Um, so now I just have a few things to say about our, um, our meadow restoration projects that's really ongoing. So we haven't gotten to a place of really having a lot of data to present yet. Um, these green dots here in the Truckee area um, are the, the bulk of them, although we also have two sites down here on the El Dorado National Forest. These green dots towards the bottom are also included in our restoration projects. Um, just an, a lovely example of a lovely meadow and why, why bumblebees might like it. There's a lot of floral resources in there, um, a lot of things for them to be foraging on. One thing that I notice different when I look at these um, really strictly at these higher elevation meadow sites is that we actually are seeing um, the, the, the bumblebee community is a lot more diverse. It tends to not be as dominated by a single species, even though the gray, gray part of this slide is that Bombus vosnesensii again. It really is our most common species, and it is, it's, you know, it is for meadows as well. But you just see bigger pieces of the pie taken up by a lot more species. And so that's something that's interesting, and it'll be interesting to track as sites get restored, how if that changes or and which species benefit the most. Uh, so I just had to show this. This is a, a lovely photo one of our field technicians took of an elk thistle, which is this uh, plant species that, uh, that we see a lot in these meadows, um, especially on the east side of the Sierra, and that really is loved by bumblebees. In this case, it's Bombus huntii, which is really more of a great basin species, but um, still nice to look at. So that brings me back to kind of where I started on how we started working with bumblebees. It was all about the species of Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, that's declining and is being considered for listing by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. It's a Forest Service sensitive species. It's, it's under review also by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, so we did all these surveys. Did we find any? And um, we found four <laughs> out of 11,000 captures. And so to me, that, you know, is pretty telling. We were working across many different vegetation communities up and down the Sierra Nevada area. Um, four out of 11,000 captures is not very many for a bumblebee species that used to be considered the most uh, common species uh, in, the, in the Western U.S. So I think, you know, the concern is definitely warranted. Um, we actually found a couple of other, we found two additional ones just where our field crews happened to find them and not during survey periods, but um, still to even six out of 11,000 is not that great. Um, and so that leads me to a project which I'm proud to have been involved with. These are the, the, uh, the my co-authors that are listed here on this paper are the real uh, bumblebee experts uh, here in the Western US, um, but because we've been doing so much work, we really had a considerable amount of data that we could share with this project. So I'm glad that we were able to, to collaborate. Um, and this is a, a project that was headed up by US Fish and Wildlife Service to, to, to look at and model where Western bumblebee um, can, are, are now and where the big information gaps are in, in our knowledge for the species. And so the, the map at the top of the screen 
the darker orange areas are the areas that the current modeling suggests that, that those are still areas that are probably the species is still hanging on but the lighter the color the closer to basically white are areas where we really are not seeing high occupancy um, very few western bumblebees which is you know what is something that our our results over the last six years have shown as well um, and so but next steps from that project is what's grown out of that is this California bumblebee atlas, which is an effort to take those mo the models that were created um, where we have and look at where we don't have good data and identify places that we need to be collecting, um, doing surveys to see whether there's Western bumblebee out there, as well as other bumblebee species, um, and, and see how we can uh, improve the, the occupancy model and, and understand what needs to happen next for the species. And this is a project that's really launching next spring. But if people are interested, it's it is a community science effort. Um, this this topo map you can see on the screen with the red square. That red square is the um, the bumblebee atlas um, grid that I adopted last year. Um, I got a few surveys in, and the Caldor fire, which if you're from Northern California, you'll be familiar with that burned through that whole area shortly after I did my first surveys, but it will still be very valuable information to look at uh, post-fire. And so if you're interested, check out this CaliforniaBumblebeeAtlas.org. Um, it's a great resource to help us sort of in a, a large collaborative effort to help the species. And then what's next for IBP and bumblebees? Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of that we do, and I hope that we can continue to do is to provide information on these important plant species for use in restoration projects. There's a lot of fire restoration and meadow restoration and other types of restoration that happen on lands across the West. And I think one of the ways that we can really um, benefit bumblebees is by having that knowledge of plants that are important to incorporate into seed mixes or to propagate and use in these projects. Um, Two up next, we're, we're also looking at some of uh, analysis on some of that temporal variation and bumblebee abundance that I was talking about, how there are certain years where you have very high numbers and other years where they're much lower and trying to tease that apart to see, um, try to learn more about what's uh, driving that, whether it's things like weather, <clears throat> floral resources. Also at all these projects, we've been collecting uh, data within all of our plots on honeybee abundance. We want to understand more about uh, how honeybees and bumblebees may be in competition um, for habitat or resources. So um, just hoping to get to that soon as well. And like I mentioned, we have that meadow restoration. Um, a number of individual meadows are going into restoration, two that have been restored, uh, three more I believe that are, are about to be restored. So hoping over time to look at how both the plants and the bumblebees respond to those restoration projects. And like I said, continuing to put input data into some of the modeling for Western bumblebee um, to help guide management for that species. Uh, we do have a proposal in the works right now to look at bumblebees within uh, aspen restoration projects. And then just this year with all the wildfires that burned in Northern California, three of the, of the project areas, the major project areas that I've been showing you on those maps actually burned again this year. And so while we don't have funding right now to look at this, there's some opportunity there to look at that um, at, at sort of year one and follow um, bumblebee abundance and species and floral use uh, in a in a you know immediate post fire context and compare it back to what things were like prior to those fires. So those are some potential opportunities out there, some that we're actually working on. And I think that's it. I just again want to acknowledge all the different partners um, on these different projects. And just show you a link to our um, our pollinator page at our website if you're interested in learning more. All, all of the different um, published papers and reports that I talked about today are also available at that page, so you can download download them. Um, or and there's contact information for me and my partner there. So I think that's it, Meredith. I think it's back to you until until we have questions. Um. <clears throat> So, oops, let me turn my video back on. Okay, here we go. Um, so let me go back. So there were a couple questions. Some people are gonna get in touch with you via email. Um, okay. And 
uh, Rich Hatfield was wondering in that what next slide, the Bombus Morrisoni photo, where he was wondering where that was taken. That was taken in Levining Canyon um, uh, by Rodney, who is I who is on this. I don't know. He's he might be muted, but um, I'm not sure if that's been uploaded. If you put that into Bumblebee um, Watch or iNaturalist, but uh, we can certainly get that information um, to you, Rich, because yeah, that we were pretty excited to see that one too. Okay. Um... And then Josie Rousseau was asking, in one of the earlier slides, you combined the number of captured bees for fire and riparian habitats together. Did you survey post-fire landscapes mainly along riparian habitats? And were the bees actually collected in burned areas? Yeah, so that's, it's kind of a mix. And we collected in, in the El Dorado project, so the sort of furthest south, um, we had, plots that were scattered across both upland and in riparian areas. And so we worked across all of those. On the Moonlight Fire, our plots were in a fire area. However, they were mostly restricted to the riparian zone just because of what the objectives for um, our, our funder on that project was really looking at riparian um, restoration needs. So they were riparian zones that had largely been burned, but to varying degrees. So some could have been really high intensity burn and some were lower intensity and some unburned um, patches as well. But that, that moonlight fire area were all within riparian zones. Okay. Um, I have another one. Um, Chris Loggers was wondering, was the time and temperature when surveying consistent from year to year? That's a good question. I mean, the, the, we did use, we, we do um, the time for sure. We tried to really make sure that because we had, and we had multiple visits each year. So let me, let me back up a little bit. It's not to say that the visit to, you know, plot A1 on this project occurred at the exact same time every year. But we generally, st we would start with our random sampling at lower elevation plots and work through all of those and then move sort of start moving into higher elevation and we would do two visits to each plot each year and so we would basically use that same process each year but um that's not to say that you know an individual plot was visited at exactly the same time year to year if that makes sense <laughs> and, and and time of day and temperature those things could um you know of course would vary somewhat but our, our we had we had minimum temperatures that we you know we did not survey when it was raining we did not survey at low like i think less than 50 degrees i think was a um, our temperature range and our and time of day was pretty consistent as well like 10 a.m to about 3 p.m okay um yeah chris also had another interesting question that i'm curious about um was, uh, have you looked at the plant species used by bumblebees relative to their facial shape? You know, when you were talking about the cheek length and stuff? Um, we have a little bit. We've, we've started some of that. And, and certainly we do see some things like uh, there's the bumblebee species sclavifrons, which is quite common in a lot of our project areas. And we definitely, we've been able to, to like for that species, key out differences in what their plant plant preferences are versus some of the other bumblebees. Um, so that they have a long face, they tend to like things like the Indian paintbrush, um, the, the delphinium, some of the longer uh, corolla flowers. And so we do see some of that. Um, and, and that's kind of one of my hopes too, as, as we have more data from more sites and more, you know, just collected that we can start to look um, really at, at plant preferences across range for individual species. It's definitely something that I'm really interested in. Cool. Um, so Gia Martin was wondering where the four captures of Occidentalis were. Were they all from the same area or different locations? I meant to, to show that on the slide and I did not. Uh, one of the captures of Occidentalis was uh, along the Little Truckee River. Uh, and I think that was 2017, um, the Brazo Meadows system. And then the other 
three or four, I don't remember how many, I guess I said, yeah, four. The other three um, were up on the Moonlight Fire and they were in slightly different areas within that fire. Um, a couple of different drainages. And then the, 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 the there I, I mentioned also that we had two other that we detected not as part of the surveys, just casually. Uh, number five uh, was up in um, the Moonlight Fire as well. And then the last one was just this year um, at Lake Almanor at the um, Canyon boat ramp right before the Dixie Fire moved through that whole area. But, um, and we, you know, we have shared those with the, the different partners you know, the land managers, so they do know where those are. But. Cool. Um, okay, uh, here's another one. Josie Rousseau was wondering, did you do point, bird point counts at all the locations where you collected bees, or was it mainly done in Plumas National? Park? It was just, yeah, it was, it was just on, uh, in the Moonlight Fire uh, footprint area, that, that one project. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> that would be pretty amazing, and I would love that, but that, um, yeah, that's that's whole uh, orders of magnitude more um, <laughs> funding and, and effort. Um, but yeah, so it's really just for those the a, a subset of the plots on the Plumas. I think so. I'm going to ask one because this is one of my favorite <laughs> bumblebee facts that I learned from you. But um, can you talk a bit about? Were how worker size changes. I mean, some of the folks on here are probably bumblebee <laughs> nerds, but I wasn't. Like how worker size changes over the course of the season. Yeah, yeah. The the first, so that first brood when the queen lays her first set of eggs and she's the one doing all the foraging for them and and keeping you know bringing food back to the them. They're they're small. They're a small little group of workers. And then once they go out and start doing collecting food and then rearing another brood. Um, as the season goes on, each uh, subsequent brood gets a little bit bigger because basically there's just more people providing food and resources. Um, and there's probably other, you know, there could be other factors as well, but uh, a lot of it is that, that you know, resource availability that there's just lots of, of hands bringing food back to the, to the, uh, to the nest. And so the yeah, individual the bumblebees... workers are actually getting larger. Yes, so by yeah. the end of the summer, and you can kind of see this like because they, it depends on the species and there's a lot of variables, you know, in here, but you can see an older worker who's, she's more worn and her wings are all tattered and she just, you know, has lost a bunch of her hair. Um, well, oftentimes if she's from the same nest will be much smaller than one that just recently emerged as a worker and is, is going about her business. They, they can be dramatically different in size to the point where those last workers are almost as big as the queens, which are, are kind of a whole nother um, level larger. Cool. Um, Mary Lou Fairweather was wondering, are your records for bumblebee and plant species of concern all entered into CNDDB? Um, the bumblebee data, I don't know if it's, so we've reported bumblebee data. We probably have, I do have to update probably for 2020 and 21, 21 still. But um, up through that, CNDDB, they have it. Whether it's been updated, I don't know. Uh, you know, within the the, the public out, outward facing part of it, um, and then plant species. That we we started talking with um, Calflora about how to best get some of our plant records. Um, you know, to, to look for a way to make that more publicly available and, and encapsulated into. Um, a database, um, but it's still, that's mostly something that, you know, is internal right now for us. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Gia was wondering, have you ever found um, their nests or their hibernate or hibernation locations? Yeah, yeah, I have. Mostly, um, I'm trying to think if I found any hibernation locations. The, I, you know, I'm not sure about that one. Um, and I've, I've gone out and looked, there's actually another kind of fun uh, community science project that people can take part in, which is actually going and, and looking for um, bumber, hibernating bumblebees. So um, oh, check that out too. <laughs> it's kind of fun. I've tried it, but I haven't found any doing it. But, but for nests we have, you know, usually it's just by chance you stumble upon a spot where you see, you know, you notice like oh, there's a lot of bumblebees right here and then just kind of start watching and looking for um, 
where they are. And we've I've had in my personally in my yard a lot of times old birdhouses have been taken over by bumblebees. There are a couple of snags that we have in our yard that have old woodpecker nests in them have been taken over by bumblebees. Uh, they bumblebees really like to nest in spots where there's um, like in old rodent nests. So either in a rodent nest underground, or it could be a rodent nest up in a, in a dead tree. Um, that's one place that you'll often find them, but it could be just under a boulder or um, even kind of in a pile of leaves. So it's, it's, it's something that um, it's fun. And we keep track of that. Anytime we find a nest, we're recording the location and the species. Um, but, but, you know, over, even over all these projects, it's, you know, probably 10, 15 nests that have been kind of stumbled upon, you know, that way. So it's not, oh, doesn't so, happen all the time. So um, Rich Hatfield posted a link to that, um, finding the queen, queen quest, finding yeah. the high earning. And then um, Chris Loggers also mentioned um, in the chat that the rogue detection team conservation dogs are or will be trying to look for queens and nests and will be interesting to see if the dogs can find them. Yeah, and for people that aren't familiar with that, there's been some work recently on, on you know, basically training scent dogs to locate nests and they've had some some pretty good luck. And so I think that's something that's really interesting that that's, um, you know, as we move forward, especially with um, at risk species and especially if they can, um, you know, get good at detecting individual uh, bumblebee species even better. But yeah, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. I'd love to, I tried to train, train my dogs, but they're just <laughs> really interested. <laughs> it actually takes some skill and the right yeah. dog. I have, my my dogs tend to like to eat bees. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I think that is. Well, I'm going to ask you one more thing because I think they're cool. But um, you you it was on one of your slides. But can you talk a little bit about cuckoo bumblebees? Because I yeah, think yeah. So that's a, another group. I mean, they're still they're still within this same group, but they're sort of their 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 own their own thing. They're the Scytherus bumblebees, which even sounds kind of a little bit rough, <laughs> but they, um, they've lost that. Like, it's interesting because they, what they do is they'll go in and overtake a nest that's already um, going. So some other bumblebee species nest, usurp the queen and basically are tricking the workers into continuing to bring food back and rearing um, their young instead of the you know the host young and so they don't produce their own workers it's really you just have two you have a male and a female the male and a queen basically um and and they don't produce um, they just produce more queens at the end of the year but they the, the workers for the other um from the other host species is rearing their young for them they've lost the they don't have one thing i didn't really mention but you probably saw it in some of the photos is that when they're collecting pollen in the out in the in the wild, they're packing it into these spots on their kind of on their legs called their corbicula, and so you get these big giant um, pockets of pollen stuck on there. And those um, cuckoo bumblebees have have really that uh, adaptation has disappeared because they don't have a worker caste. They don't go out and collect and bring back. They just go and you know forage for themselves. But um, the queens and the males, but they don't bring it back, so they don't have that characteristic, which is one of the the characteristics that can make them that we use an identification too for those species. And so they've lost some of the other. Um, there's just some other things about them. They have bigger, like meaner jaws, for for <laughs> aggressively taking over and just other stuff. But they're very interesting, and um, some of the cuckoo bumblebees are um, more specific to certain host bumblebee species while others are more generalist and will take over kind of a wider range of, of host bumblebee species nest. And so we, we probably will see some, you know, you're seeing declines in when, you, when a host, when a very, we have a very tight relationship between maybe one or two hosts and a, um, a cuckoo, those as the, if those host species are one that happens to be declining, then you're also gonna see declines in those cuckoo bumblebees as well. Cool. cool. Um, I think that is it on the questions. And I would like to thank everybody for attending and thank Helen, especially for giving such a great talk. Um, and then if you think of some question later on, um, uh, you can find Helen's email on our webpage birdpop.org. 
Um, and I will put it here in the chat if that's okay, Helen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, thanks everybody for joining us.